Lord Dunaren isn't discussed much, but so much cliffhangers and mysteries in the book's story is still pieced together, but he's a major figure in the fake world. He's credited as the man who started Robert's Rebellion. He just wasn't as charismatic as Bobby, nor did he do any notable fighting. He began the revolt against the Mad King by refusing to execute and send over the heads of two boys under his care. It was an easy decision for John Aaron though. He viewed his wards as his own children. Their bonds were made even closer considering the aging lord had no kids of his own at the time. Ned Stark had been living in the Vale since he was 8 years old, sent over to strengthen the relationship between the great houses. John Aaron got to know Lord Rickard Stark and Lord Stephen Baratheon during their time at war, fighting off an invasion some years prior, and became friends. Robert was only a year older than Ned, so even though we don't know the exact age of when he became John Aaron's ward, it's safe to assume around the same time as 8 year old Ned. The three of them were family. John was their second father, a patient and wise man. You have to be patient when raising a kid like Robert. As fun as he is at parties, he was definitely a handful. Their lives weren't perfect at the Vale. Robert was expected to be the new Lord of Storm's End at 16 after his parents' death at sea. But instead of leaving John and Ned, he decided to split his time in both castles. Robert had no love for his own family, not even his cute baby brother Renly. John and Ned were his chosen family, so he was ecstatic to be betrothed to Ned's sister, Lyanna Stark, bonding them by blood. Lord Rickard Stark was happy too. It had been his life's goal to build outside alliances for the Starks, who historically usually married within the North. Lyanna was the only one not so thrilled. She could see through Robert. Rumors reached her about him already having made a bastard in the Vale. He would never be faithful to her. Rickard's heir, Brandon Stark, would marry a Tully, making a strong four-house bond. On his way to marry Catelyn Tully, Brandon receives urgent news that his little sister Lyanna has gone missing, kidnapped by the Prince Rhaegar Targaryen. During Brandon's last encounter with the prince, he had to be restrained after Rhaegar handed Lyanna a rose. He took it as a slight since Rhaegar was already married with kids and Lyanna betrothed to Robert. There was no one to restrain Brandon now. He ditched his wedding to seek justice for Lyanna, shouting for Rhaegar to come out of his castle to die. This foolish threat set the Mad King off. The King had no love for his son and heir, in fact he feared him. But in the Mad King's increasingly paranoid state, this was an attack on House Targaryen. Emotions got the best of Brandon, I guess that's why he's called the Wild Wolf. Brandon and all of his companions with him at the time were arrested. Only one innocent squire was free to go. The rest had to have their fathers come to court and answer for their son's crimes. The Mad King had been spiraling over the years, but this was his cruelest act. Fathers and sons all killed. Special attention was paid to make sure Lord Rickard and Brandon Stark went out in the most painful way possible. One of the men killed was John Aaron's heir, a nephew, and the Mad King still expected him to send the heads of the boys he raised for 10 years. It was then that John Aaron called his banners. He knew the Four Kingdom Alliance had a chance at a successful rebellion, especially since the Mad King inspired no love. But what if he followed through with the orders to avoid war? Catelyn seems to know the answer. In the second chapter of the very first book, she thinks to herself, had he done as he was commanded, the Mad King might yet sit the Iron Throne. Despite his advanced years, Lord Aaron fought valiantly beside Robert on the Trident. After the war, the new king proved his wisdom when he made Lord John Aaron his first hand. She thinks highly of the old man who eventually married her sister Lysa Tully during that double wedding ceremony with Ned and Kat. But I think Kat was very wrong with her opinion here. She isn't a great critical thinker after all. If John Aaron sacrificed his two wards, 15 years later, there is no chance the Mad King would still be sitting on the Iron Throne. The Mad King feared keeping Ned and Robert alive in case one day they would seek vengeance. He feared Tywin and Rhaegar more. If only King Aerys was kinder to his old friend Tywin, he would have remained his strongest ally. The Mad King pushed Tywin away and Rhaegar with his constant out-of-pocket remarks. When Rhaegar finally came out of hiding with Lyanna Stark, his last words to young Kingsguard member Jaime Lannister were that changes would be made after all the smoke clears. With Tywin storming out of King's Landing, resigning his hand, the Mad King's remaining loyal men were Varys, his master of whispers, all the pyromancers under his employment making wildfire, and House Valerion. None liked Ares, but knew how to manipulate him to get what they want. The easiest way was to insult Tywin. Varys is a mystery though, I have no idea why he remained so loyal for so long. Yes, Ares was the one to hire him and bring him over to this continent, but he would have seen the direction things were going in the Seven Kingdoms being as smart as he is. 
Ares was developing a taste for torture. He got pleasure from specifically seeing others burned alive by wildfire. We know for a fact how Tywin felt about Ares leading up to the rebellion. When the Mad King was kidnapped and held hostage late into his reign, Tywin, who was in command of the situation, was fine with letting his king die. As the captors at the castle Duskendale threatened, if he stormed their gates. Most of the small council were with the hand outside Duskendale at this juncture, and several of them argued against Lord Tywin's plan on the grounds that such an attack would almost certainly goad Lord Darklyn into putting King Aerys to death. Tywin's exact words were, he may or he may not, but if he does, we have a better king right here, whereupon he raised a hand to indicate Prince Rhaegar. He wouldn't have so openly said that without considering putting the Mad King aside for a new king. Barristan Selmy saw how dire the situation was and single-handedly rescued Ares in the cover of night. Varys also believed the beginnings of a coup were in the works, led by Rhaegar. Varys believed House Went of Harrenhal organized that big tourney where Rhaegar first met Lyanna in order for Rhaegar's faction to gain supporters. And there actually are some hints at this being true. Major characters who were loyal to Rhaegar were Lord John Cunnington, Sir Miles Mouton, Sir Richard Lawnmouth, and three knights of the King's Guard, Prince Lewin Martell, Sir Oswald Went, and his best pal, Sir Arthur Dane. Having Arthur Dane as your right-hand man is huge. He's the most loved and admired knight of this era, even with Barristan and Selmy around. All Dornishmen in court were with Rhaegar too, as well as the younger men. Eventually, Rhaegar won over the Lord Commander of the King's Guard, Sir Gerald Hightower, but never Barristan. Barry is not the kind of character you approach with plans of treason, despite how evil the Mad King was becoming. Barristan the Bold is as simple as they come. He's a good knight that follows all orders, but not much else thinking goes up on his head. He stayed with the Mad King to the very end. When Rhaegar disappeared with Lyanna in the Riverlands, he did so with unnamed companions. Arthur Dane and Ozo Went are guaranteed to be two of them since they're with Rhaegar and Lyanna in the Tower of Joy. The other four will eventually be name dropped in a coming book. Even if Robert's Rebellion didn't occur, Lyanna would still likely be found dead in that bed of blood. But Ned wouldn't be the one to find her, and Robert would never be the one to kill Rhaegar. So Jon Snow with his real given name by Lyanna and Rhaegar would be raised as a prince, not a bastard. Rhaegar was set on making a third child, but his wife Elia Martell could no longer safely get pregnant again with her frail health. Being obsessed with the promised prince prophecy, three children would be the three heads of the dragon that would save the world against darkness. Rhaegar's previous two with Elia Martell, Rhaenys, and Aegon would not have been killed on Tywin's orders. Elia's honor as a princess would still have been spit on for running away with Lyanna, but at least she would be alive too. The only issue remaining for Rhaegar and his faction would be the North and House Baratheon. How Stark's rule would pass to Benjen, a boy too young to worry the Mad King. That's why he never ordered his head too. If the Aarons and Tullys remain neutral, Benjen and Stannis wouldn't stand a chance against Rhaegar. In this drastically alternate timeline, maybe Littlefinger actually gets with Catelyn. But let's be real, neither Lord Hoster Tully or Cat would want that. Cat would be with Benjen. The Starks and Baratheons would have to accept no justice would be served for what the Mad King did, as much as Rhaegar would try to patch things up. He was famously lovable, though never being able to love others. He's near perfect. He knew how to win Lyanna's heart in only a moment, and knew he had to win a tourney at Harrenhal to get that chance. Through time, this universe's Jon Snow could fix relations with the North, being half Stark, half Targaryen. But Stannis, being 17 or 18 at the time of Robert's murder, will still be a thorn in their side, with his strong sense of justice. Cersei would still be boinking her twin brother Jaime, but Tywin would have to keep looking for a match he deemed suitable for her. Even in this timeline, she'll never marry Rhaegar like Tywin hoped. Maybe Edmure Tully or even Prince Viserys, if the 10 year old age gap between the two didn't bother Tywin. The exact method of removing the Mad King from power wouldn't be clean. Tywin and Rhaegar may butt heads on the details. You can't just have a trial against the king. Using his violent history and mental instability, Rhaegar and Tywin would have to convince the realm he has become unfit to rule, something that's never happened in their 300 year long dynasty. Ares would want Rhaegar and Tywin dead, but with so few men loyal to him, it would never happen. A comfortable retirement home like prison with padded walls, maybe even in a castle, would do. His sister wife Rael would raise Viserys and newborn Danny on her own. I think Rael wouldn't die giving birth during that traumatic pregnancy in this timeline. She had to travel by sea to get away from the action that was about to take place in King's Landing. The Mad King wanted Rael to give birth on Dragonstone. 
Rael had to read letter after letter about every battle the Mad King lost to Robber, to finally finding out her firstborn son Rhaegar was killed. When she finally went into labor, it was during a massive storm at Dragonstone that destroyed the Targaryen's fleet. Couldn't have helped her odds at surviving. Daenerys was born with the nickname Stormborn, and the loss of Rael devastated little Viserys. Rhaegar was never allowed to be near Viserys, because the Mad King didn't trust his own heir. A mother and a role model would have done wonders for young Viserys, whose trauma is what led to all his issues. Littlefinger would have never been brought to court by Lord Jon Arryn and bring on chaos to the Seven Kingdoms. An honestly nice sounding outcome that wouldn't make for a very good book series. Things would have been better under Rhaegar than with the reckless King Robber, at the cost of a father sacrificing his only two sons.